Uh, hello, everyone. Columbia GCEP is pleased to have David Lee, a 2002 MR graduate, offer an introduction on the front of JJP architects and planners. With an in-depth looks and the recently complete joint group global headquarters, for which he served as a project architect. The presentation will range from commission to construction, exploring how architectural design helped giants real, realize a new headquarter and cycling museum, beating their status as the world's leading manufacturer of uh, high quality bicycles. Lively is an associate and director of international affairs at JJP Architects and Planners. The firm was founded 40 years ago by the Josh Japan, <coughs> the fellow of AIA, 1967 MR graduate, a recipient of Taiwan's National Award for Arts in 2015, and the benefactor of a new scholarship fund at GSEP. Welcome. Him. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. Um, it's early in Taiwan, but good, good evening, New York. Um, I'm very happy that you guys can all join us. So uh, the time is short, so I will go ahead and jump right into the presentation. So um, uh, once again, I'm David Lee uh, and Mark uh, 2002, and uh, it's been um, almost 20 years. It's, uh <laughs> tells you how old I am, but I'm um, very happy to have this opportunity sort of uh, return to the school uh, virtually and to share a little bit about the firm I'm currently working at and also the project that uh, recently completed. Okay, so um, a little bit about the firm um, JJP um, in the beginning. So um, this is sort of um, put us on the map and also put Taiwan on the map. So uh, most of you are probably here in New York uh, where the yellow marker is. And I'm in JJP and where I am currently is this on uh, this halfway across the globe on uh, the island of Taiwan. And for those of you who haven't been to Taiwan, uh, this is sort of a, the two magazine covers here. The one on the left is a Japanese magazine and it shows a typical uh, street scene in Taiwan. Uh, so you can see that Taiwan is a very interesting and lively place. And on the right, you see this cover, recent cover on, from The Economist uh, magazine that says uh, Taiwan is a very, is the most dangerous place on earth. Uh, that's probably uh, mostly due to some, the, sometimes the bad relations also with our very fearsome neighbor, China. So sometimes Taiwan is caught between the US and China, this power struggle. But um, and this diagram, uh, this looks like some of the diagrams that you probably do in school, is actually the latest current weather map uh, it shows a typhoon approaching Taiwan. I think today is actually the is when it's supposed to make a landfall in Taiwan. So I guess at least for a day, uh, Taiwan is probably one of the most dangerous places on earth. So on a good day, um, you know, with, with no typhoon, uh, this is what uh, a Taipei uh, kind of looks like. Uh, the skyline is dominated by what was once uh, the world's tallest tower, uh, Taipei 101, uh, and named named so because of uh, the 101 floors uh, in the building. So uh, if you do, uh, I think some of you might be very curious about like what is Taiwanese architecture? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, if you could look up, just type those as a keyword in Google, this is what you get. So it has a very uh, heavy mix of uh, traditional Chinese influence uh, and a sprinkle with some uh, modern icons. So in this kind of um, background, um, JJP Architects and Planners uh, has been, we've been around for 40 years. To, this year is actually our 40th anniversary as founded by um, Joshua G. Pan. And now you know where the letters come from, JJP. Uh, he's also a graduate of uh, GSEP, uh, 67 and Mark. Um, he has a very distinguished career and uh, both uh, winning the National Award of Arts in Taiwan and also named a fellow of the AIA. So we have close to about 300 uh, uh, colleagues now. Uh, we've won numerous awards and then we've completed over 700 projects in Taiwan overseas. So it's one of the largest uh, firms in Taiwan. So we have a very diverse uh, portfolio. And then uh, our uh, core values are based on the Confucius saying, uh, which uh, roughly traces that is respect and uh, natural principles, and you have to properly utilize technologies and materials. 
and you have to display empathy towards mankind. And, and once you've done all three, then you can totally enjoy your freedom in design. So this is a big family photo um, that was taken recently. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's a very, and this is right outside of our offices. Uh, so it's a, a several townhouses hidden in a residential alleyway. And for those of you who have worked here or visited us, you'll be very uh, surprised that uh, you know one of the largest architecture firms in Taiwan is actually hidden in, in this kind of setting. So this photo only shows about half of our employees, 100, 150 or 60 people or so based in the Taiwan office. So how the firm has grown uh, spatially and uh, in the very kind of organic, if you're looking at this uh, short GIF animation here. So it started as one townhouses, then we sort of you know, gradually uh, expanded leftwards, uh, rightwards, upwards, and even across the alley. So now this is sort of a exploded di spatial diagram of the current firm right now. So I think we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven townhouses. Um, and can, uh, but in what, but the townhouses there is it's kind of similar to the townhouses that you see in Manhattan and uh, Brooklyn. So these railroad configurations, and then so but it's packed with a lot of people. So um, you know it's very tight, very cozy work environment, but um, you know not good for COVID, obviously. So half of the people, including myself, uh, we're working from home now. Uh, so um, that's a Taipei office. But we also have uh, offices in Beijing, Shanghai, and Xiamen. And we also have a sister company that specializes in interior design and also another sister company that um, does um, structural engineering. So uh, obviously to sustain such a large operations, uh, we do a very wide range of projects. And uh, because of the reputation built up over the years, we actually uh, obtaining work is actually relatively not so difficult for us because most of our clients are repeat clients or referrals. So, but we do uh, also uh, actively uh, seek out new projects. And then uh, we actually have built all uh, across the globe uh, um, throughout Asia and even uh, quite a few projects in the US. I think the closest one being in New York is a church in Rutgers, uh, New Jersey. So, um, we take a very um, or non-traditional approach to very challenging building typologies. So this is one of the world's largest semiconductor uh, fabrication plants uh, by TSMC. So um, you know it's a big box typology, but then uh, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, making the um, building more uh, humanistic and also a lot more sustainable. So you can see these green walls and extensive landscaping around the uh, fabrication plant. And this is actually a logistics center, a uh, big warehouse. Uh, it's a located, located uh, right next to the high-speed rail tracks. So we try to give a very dynamic composition to a, a otherwise very static volume. And this is a university library uh, designed uh, by JJP about 30 years ago. Uh, and then contrast that with a public library that we did that about 10 years ago. So the same typology, but very different in form and uh, materials. And, uh, and this is a gymnasium uh, right uh, outside of Taipei on the mountain, Yamingshan. Uh, it's also for university. So here is this, we've uh, exploring this theme of expressing the structure. So you can see these big trusses through the glass that holds up the gymnasium. And then uh, you see this uh, new uh, bank uh, headquarters building that's currently under construction in the heart of Taipei. So it's the same theme trying to uh, express the structure. And we also um, did the Red Dot Museum in Xiamen, uh, which was converted from an old aircraft hangar. And then we also did this um, a pop-up installation, so a pavilion at a Lantern Festival. So uh, it was only up for about uh, a month and then all the materials has been disassembled and recycled. So, um, so throughout its 40 years of history, uh, we, the a firm has always maintained a very international outlook. So, and we've uh, very diligent in about uh, uh, publishing our works. So we've had four uh, monographs uh, from 1999 to the most recent, which is about three years ago. Uh, it's, and the, 
the text is all in Mandarin, Chinese, and English from the very beginning. So for those of you who are interested, I think you can certainly look it up. Uh, I think there's the, probably all four are still available online. Okay, so that's a little bit about the firm. Now we go into the project. So um, it's, it's for a giant, head, a giant group, a global headquarters. So I'm not sure how many of you had heard of giant bicycles. Uh, some of you uh, probably not, but some of you probably have even ridden a giant bicycle. So it is uh, one of the, it is the world's largest uh, bicycle manufacturer. And then uh, it's also one of the leading brands actually. And so they do a right, wide range of bicycles from road bikes to mountain bikes. And they're also a very, uh, pioneer in uh, carbon fiber technology. So very sleek, uh, very uh, fancy looking bikes that go very fast. Um, so, and it's, uh, it's almost, and throughout, it's, actually it's approaching us of 40 years also uh, for Giant. And then uh, it has started out uh, like many Taiwanese manufacturers. It started out as OEM, um, basically making bikes for other uh, brands such as um, Specialized. Uh, but now it's uh, become, it's also developed uh, one of its own brand, Giant. So, um, and then and then thus becoming one of the actually most valuable brands in Taiwan. Um, so it's currently ranked number six. And then, but um, it's um, previous headquarters uh, is the building shown about six, six story building on the right and, and right next to it, their adjacent factory. Uh, it was nine, completed in 1984. So I think back then, it was already uh, sort of impressive, but there was no real uh, effort at trying to com um, com convey more um, positive uh, corporate image. So when we got the task, it, that was became immediately became one of the biggest challenges. And uh, if you contrast the location of the previous headquarters, the one shown in satellite image on the left, so it's actually located in the middle of the fields in a very, um, it's almost like a very rural um, area. Um, but contrast that to the uh, the new site they selected for the uh, new headquarters, the one on the right, which is right in the middle of uh, Science Park in, in Taiwan. So Taiwan has, uh, uh, throughout the island, they have uh, several of these major science parks. And these parks are established to sort of attract all the high-tech uh, manufacturers to locate um, their um, facilities here. So the one, the TSMC plant that I was previously showed is actually diagonally across from the giant headquarters. So just this move of, uh, you know, um, out from a very rural context into a, a, a right next to um, being neighbors with all these leading uh, technology, manu high-tech manufacturers of um, Taiwan, it really shows their ambition uh, of giant trying to become uh, on an equal footing with all these uh, other much bigger companies. So, and, and the site itself also presented um, some very um, difficult challenges. Uh, first of all, it's a very um, narrow site and, and then uh, there's a big steep slope uh, to the west. So the actually the available width of the site is only about 55 uh, meters and it's about uh, three times as long, about 155 meters long. Uh, but there's also uh, it's located right at, uh, at a major uh, thoroughfare and there's a big uh, stormwater conduits outside of site. So the access to the site becomes an, uh, uh, an issue. And also um, the, to the north is actually this uh, golf course, uh, which you think it, ha it has very good views, but uh, the best views actually towards the downtown Taichung uh, where the city where the uh, site is located is actually to the south. Um, and then we have also have to integrate um, these um, pedestrian and also a bicycle pass how, how, in terms of the access to the site. So, um, you know, uh, and then looking at the uh, larger context of the site uh, within the science park, you can see the golf course and then also uh, surrounded actually by these big uh, fabrication plants like such as TMC. TSMC that makes uh, uh, the, the chips and a lot of them are probably in your iPhones. Uh, the chips are made by TSMC. And then you also across the street, you have um, AUO that makes all these display panels. So you think like all these, um, you know, um, electronic uh, products and then what, what, what is a bicycle manufacturer, you know, doing uh, in the middle of this. And so in terms of like sheer 
um, size, you can see there's, there's no way that uh, Giant can compete uh, with all of these. Um, but there's one commonality to all, all these projects. They're all actually all designed by JJP. So that just shows you like the dominant role that uh, the firm has played uh, throughout the, um, in, in the high tech industry. So like all the TSMC and A AOU plants are designed by JAP. Um, and actually when uh, the giant project was uh, constructing the, the, the TSMC plant right on the top of the hill uh, was actually also being constructed. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting that to see like, oh, you know, it's hard. I think it's hard to, uh, not very often you see uh, instance where all, all the surrounding buildings actually are designed by the same firm or over and such different um, uh, uh, different approaches and different uh, typologies. So, um, you know, it's very different, obviously, um, uh, working with a client such as TMTC who is very strict on protocols and they're also very, uh, very uh, schedule demanding because all they have all meet these production deadlines. So, and uh, whereas versus giant, their culture is a bit more laid back, uh, uh, just as demanding, but uh, more laid back. And throughout the process, we're uh, we're constantly reminded by the giant uh, people that uh, you know it takes you know like TSMC can s uh, sell one chip, uh, but they have to probably have to sell ten bicycles to make the same amount of money. So uh, so budget was actually also a very big uh, concern uh, for them. So uh, this is, uh, uh, again, looking at the context, you have these big box, uh, big boxes. So our challenge uh, is to how to, you, how to stand out uh, in, in the sea of um, these uh, big volumes. So, and the, the, uh, at the current uh, manufacturing headquarters, there was uh, the biggest um, feature was this uh, big uh, water tower. Uh, uh, so that, that sort of acts as the um, icon. Of the so then when we got the design brief, our biggest challenge was okay, how do we create a, a, a new icon for Giant, uh, uh, and then uh, how can the architecture become a more active role in in doing that? So we went back to this is the founder of Giant uh, Group, and he's also he's since retired, but he had a quote. Uh, he once told us that walking is too slow and driving is too fast but um, cycling is just right. So um, the speed, so we realize the speed, uh, like he's very um, big um, believer in cycling and then the speed of uh, riding a bicycle. So we kind of want to capture that in our design and also how, you know, uh, most often uh, when you go ride a bike is usually in tandem or with a friend or a partner. So like how these, um, uh, maybe there could be more than one volume uh, to satisfy the program. Uh, requirements um, because there was a program they wanted an office but they also wanted a cycling uh, a museum as part of their um, headquarters new headquarters so um, this is in the competition stage there was uh, I think three or four firms invited to a competition so in the competition uh, phase we did two schemes one was a little more erected and linear but uh, but still a very sculpted um, dynamic composition the towers and the big base. And the second scheme that we presented was a more uh, curvilinear uh, with a very uh, fluid base and a, uh, and a more uh, striking tower. And obviously um, you, being from Columbia, I think you can uh, all guess like which firm, uh, which scheme uh, <laughs> that I favor most. But and I think in the end, we're very uh, happy that the, collected, that the client selected us and then the scheme moving forward. So, um, so once we got the project, it was really to say, how do we give the form to, 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 to do, which was, you know, uh, how to take that scheme and, and move it forward. So again, um, um, going back to their logo, uh, which again, I was also trying to convey the sense of motion. Okay, so we sort of take that and then try to really integrate that into some of the forms that the, to sculpt the building and also, um, uh, so through a process of, uh, you know, trying out with models, um, uh, obviously we use a lot of 3D skills, but I think the model still gives, especially when uh, it became clear that the programs would, uh, the best solution would be to separate the programs, um, the museum to the left, and also the tower that houses all the office and research facilities. 
So um, obviously all the models are 3D printed. So gradually through a process, I think over a year, the form of the building be, be, um, began to um, be finalized. And then um, it was throughout, the, and, and then it was also in the process of designing that we realized the, the facade, the Eastern facade, that actually faces the um, city, the, the outline, the silhouette of it actually sort of uh, resembles the uh, shape of the island of uh, Taiwan. So that, uh, sort of for us, it was a, a very pleasant uh, surprise that, uh, you know, this sort of uh, uh, giant, the, the, lead, the world's leading uh, bicycle manufacturer actually just sort of like conveyed the notion that it's actually the pride of Taiwan. And then through these forms that actually, they, we're trying to create this um, uh, motion, uh, this uh, sense of notion like of moving upwards that brings you visually and through uh, that this facade that faces the Southwest actually becomes very important. And then uh, this is a completed project and uh, looking at the project uh, located between the two big TSMC facilities also designed by JTP again. So it's a very, uh, dynamic uh, composition that sort of stands out from these big boxes. And then we really try to push um, the building to the, uh, the height in terms of the height limits to make it more stand out. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of the background of the project. Now in terms of uh, some basic facts, so uh, it's about, uh, the total floor is about 33,000 square meters. Uh, and the uh, HQ is uh, 15 uh, stories and uh, uh, two floors of uh, basement and the museum is three stories, also connected by a common share, common basement. Uh, the construct, the design phase took about a year and a half, and the construction was uh, again another three years, uh, completed in 2019, end of 2019. So and this is the site plan. As you can see, is we're trying to uh, trying to fit all the program and into a very um, tight site. So uh, we try to. Uh, to, but with that, but I think the in terms of the um, site layout, the key is to how do we you know, besides uh, positioning these two buildings, how do we the space between them actually becomes a very important. It's almost like the third element um, uh, to to the composition. So you're just looking at an area photo. So and then how in terms of the paving, which they wanted to to be more open. To, uh, in order to have uh, events in the future, like how to create a sense of movement uh, that brings in people um, from the outside. So we have, and then uh, from, and then, so there's a fourth, and there's a fourth floor um, a rooftop that's for uh, their employees. It's right outside of the cafeteria. And, but the middle ground, uh, the middle plaza is really where the heart for us is the heart of the project. That's where all the people come together. And then it's leading up to the big set of stairs to the museum and also these ramps that takes you up the, 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 the um, headquarters podium. So this is again looking from, so um, the museum obviously is in the foreground. Uh, so it does not uh, re require a lot of windows. Um, so that gave us the opportunity to really sculpt it in a way that uh, that's very pristine and very clean, clad in aluminum panels. And on the south facade, we actually did the logo, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then the office building, in, in contrast, uh, obviously needs a lot more openness. Uh, so we have this language where these um, slab edge covers are, are articulated carefully to create a sense of uh, movement. Uh, to quick in a section. So you can see a uh, section of big um, open volume as soon as you enter the museum and also a two-story lobby in the office with a grand set of stairs leading up to the auditorium and then uh, this form that gradually tapers up uh, as the, the tower goes up. And in terms of we also paid a lot of attention to uh, sustainability and really try and the biggest um, one of the biggest moves we made was to have these deep balconies at the south side for shading. And then we tried to uh, integrate as much as natu natural ventilation as possible. So all the skylights actually can open up. And then, uh, and also in terms of uh, encouraging people to uh, use less of the elevators and really to walk around um, the buildings, we uh, put in a lot of stairs um, to encourage people to do so. And then, uh, so again, back to these balconies on the south side, this is the early studies. So we knew like the south side afforded the best views, but also in most um, 
urgent in terms of shading, the need for shading. So we created these deep balconies that allow people on every floor, uh, on the office floor to actually go out uh, for a break and then also provide uh, the, the shading for the building. So here you can see uh, that, that we place the core, the service core to the west side, which effectively blocks out all the Western sun. And then on the balcony on the south side, uh, to support these balconies um, because of the, the overhang, you actually need a deeper structure. Uh, so actually that naturally led to the design solution where the slab covers on the south side are much deeper. And as you, and you go to the north side where the light is more even, the, the need for shading becomes less so. Uh, so the slab cover can go, go down to a much narrower profile. So just this, is, just this um, simple move actually led to a very, uh, the sense of rhythm uh, movement up and around the building. So this is the building looking from the, uh, the museum, looking from the top. So again, we're tre treating the roof as almost like the fifth facade that's also very carefully designed uh, with a very a slit as a skylight. And then uh, and here you see the two buildings from the street level. Uh, so this tower, the striking form that appears as you round the intersection. So some of the design challenges, I'll quickly go through the project. Um, so uh, this, because of this project, uh, the unique shape of the project and also the budget concerns. So we are actually spending a lot of time like trying to, uh, even in the bidding phase, trying to explain that although it looks complicated uh, at first glance, but most of the facade is actually flat. Uh, and the, uh, the biggest, uh, with the exception of the southwest, uh, uh, southeast corner where the balconies are, those are the areas with the deepest overhang and the most curvature in the panels. So again, looking at this area, which is section cut through. So, this, so uh, in the end, we were able to, to um, through an optimi optimization of design that actually, um, although the building looks very fluid uh, and dynamic, actually 91% 90, of the panels, the aluminum panels are actually flat. And on the, the most complicated, uh, form of the open, which is a double curved, uh, which I think all of you uh, use a lot probably in your uh, design. So those only co constitute about 3% of the actual panels. So when the contractors, when they bid for a project, they know that it's actually not, they won't price it all as double curved. It's actually uh, more of a flat curve, the more typical kind. And then we actually show them exactly how much of a curvature these panels have. Uh, so that can pr provide a more accurate bid. Same process was ca also carried out on the museum building where the biggest curvatures occur at the corners. Again, showing a percentage of the flat versus the curved panels. And then uh, through uh, the, I think this was even done in Rhino, that you can actually sh sh put a gradient in terms of the curvature, on, on, map it onto the um, building. So actually quite clear, show you the, the portions in red has the biggest amount of curvatures. Um, so we did, and also that we actually com convert that to showing how the structural support underneath uh, and the, the angles of this and the, how, the, 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 the amount of angle variations the supports need to have. And then um, we also have uh, engaged a consultant that specialize in these ge geome geometry optimization that were, so a lot of the curvature lines that we actually were able to be um, broken down into straight lines. So the, uh, so it's more of a segmented curve uh, without losing the overall effect. And then and we actually, this was even in the design stage, we worked with the manufacturer just, just trying to see the limits of the aluminum, like how, how far can the manufacturing capabilities are and then did the material itself, how much of a curvature can it actually withstand. So it's a very rudimentary markup. Uh, then followed by uh, once the project was awarded, there was a uh, on site. There was a very extensive uh, visual mockup that sort of uh, actually incorporated almost all of the conditions that you will see on the building. This is a one-to-one -one scale, um, and then uh, and then we follow carry the same process even throughout the manufacturing. We actually made several visits to the manufacturing plants. You know, this this is the flat panel on the museum. It's six meters tall. Uh, each panel, uh, a meter and and. 1.2 meters wide. So that's really uh, pushing the envelope of the uh, manufacturing because uh, the equipment is such a large size, it becomes a, a very challenging issue, both in terms of forming the panels and also uh, painting the panels. 
And then we also look at the conditions where the panels are curved, and then not only from the front, but also from the back, you know, looking at how the supports uh, can be placed. So all that effort is really just to um, make sure that in the end, when these panels are installed on site, uh, no matter their location, no matter their curvature, actually look, will actually look uh, the way that we wanted it to look. So uh, because the uh, the the aluminum, uh, so because that would actually make or break the 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 over the uh, overall uh, effect of the building. So again, is a close up uh, looking at the roof of the um, um, the museum. So every single um, joint, every single line is actually uh, designed um, by us, and then uh, and through this extensive process of uh, verification on in the shop and also on site that we were able to achieve these results. So uh, you know, those of you who have some practical, practical experience will surely know that you know it's uh, although it's much easier to design a curved building now, but it's actually a lot more hard, hard, difficult, challenging uh, when you actually should try to put to realize it. So we actually spent a lot of time uh, going obsessing over the details. So uh, as you can see here. And then uh, we also, in, even in terms of the glass that, um, you know, as you approach it, we won't, when, when, when people uh, along the sequence of uh, entering the museum, they walk along this big, uh, glass wall that you can actually look inside the museum to get a glimpse in that museum you actually enter. And, but we, we didn't want to be just a regular wall, you know, so glass wall. We actually uh, had this idea of um, tilting the glass and actually the, the, the amount of tilt actually varies uh, as you approach the entrance. So um, it goes very from a more like almost like 60 degree angle and back to a 90 degree angle when you arrive at the doors. So this is, uh, we did a scenario uh, in a computer and then in, but then the challenge becomes, okay, you know, we're not gonna do curved glass. So how do we, uh, but we're still a very much a regular curtain wall um, stick system. So how do we allow for these different panels uh, to be accommodated within the same system? So I actually had to allow a much more, uh, a, a much larger pocket, so to speak, in the mullions to accommodate this shift in the glass, and both vertically and, uh, and horizontally. And then uh, even the structural design uh, for the project is all, all the engineers uh, actually did um, followed our lead and did extensive, you know, sort of really, really pushing the boundaries of what uh, Taiwan, the construction industry has been. So uh, from, from, the, from a rhino skin to a tech class structural model, and then even all the embeds were also done in, in, and modeled in, in Rhino. And so every face of the structure actually um, being flattened out for analysis. And also um, the contractor, we required a contractor to, uh, based on our design to actually produce a BIM model to integrate the structure and all the MEP work. And then uh, invariably in the process of doing so, there'll be a lot of conflicts so, um, you know, I personally went down to Taichung almost every week for a period about a year and a half on these site meetings. And most of the time was just trying to resolve all these coordination issues. So I actually learned a lot in that, during that time period. And also, so some of them, some of the issues can be resolved uh, by modifying design. And some of them is really just uh, the contractor uh, has to uh, sort of modify their means and methods of because uh, our core principle is always we want to maintain the the look of the building. There's no compromise there, but anything underneath that, we uh, so we can discuss the best way uh, uh, moving forward. And then also the MEP uh, work was also uh, carefully uh, modeled in in the BIM model with all these different color codes for the different pipes. So the building would not only looks neat and clean from the outside, but actually the inside, all, all the um, conduits are actually have a very strict uh, uh, organization to them. Uh, so even with all the advancements in the um, computer, a lot of the detailing uh, still uh, also we explore uh, using hand-drawn. We have a very, a very capable uh, technical team in the office. Uh, so they actually, we actually drew up a lot of these, uh, in, in, and then from that, uh, the the contractor would uh, do the shop drawings uh, for, for verification, and then in the mock-up, 
So we would, uh, again, in the mock-up, we would uh, simulate all these uh, different situations. And so that's also, so we would pay regular visits uh, with Mr. Pan and also um, the clients, there's me uh, down in the photo with the founder and the current CEO of the company. So trying to really explain the, the, the ins and outs of the design. And then this is another detail uh, showing how the, uh, glass curtain wall, the mullion is attached to the structure, the main structure. Um, so it's a steel um, structure building. So uh, it's very, it's always fascinating to see uh, steel uh, work going up, especially when a lot of the um, connections are very non-standard. Um, and they were, so the steel was selected for the towers and then a concrete shell uh, structure uh, was uh, selected for the museum. Um, but that uh, because of the constructability and also the waterproofing qualities of the concrete. So that's the main reason why it was selected. Uh, but because of this big opening, skylight opening here, there's a lot of worries about how it might settle. So there are actually uh, a lot of monitoring, extensive monitoring was done both um, during construction and even post-construction, we keep monitoring the end right now. And a lot of it is because it's from a structure engineering point of view, it's actually really exceeded uh, what the limits of the, the software can, uh, you know, simulate. So we, so it's a big lesson, a uh, valuable lesson for all parties involved. And then uh, in terms of concrete, it's always very, um, it's always this um, suspense uh, because uh, once you, you really don't know what it'll look like, uh, you know, you see the formwork being going up and the concrete being poor, but it's only when the formwork comes up that you actually see the building. Um, so the, in terms of scaffolding, I think the, the contractor did a very good job because in this, uh, in the museum building, even in some of the columns are actually follow the um, exterior. So they have this uh, angle column. So, they are, so uh, how the round column uh, connects to a um, beam and the slab, so that becomes a very critical detail. So here you can see the uh, two buildings going up. And then this is uh, looking uh, up at the um, skylight in the top floor of the museum. So you can see it's about uh, almost 100 feet, uh, about 30 meter uh, wide, uh, long uh, opening. So it's uh, very visually stunning, but I think uh, when they first, uh, when, when they first were taking, um, dismantling the formwork, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> I was very, uh, very worried actually. Uh, but again, again, very, uh, very happy that uh, it's easy of pulling it off. So this is, this is various stages of the construction, you know, um, building going up, scaffolding uh, coming down, and then finally revealed what the final project looks like. So it's big, big sigh of relief. Everybody like, oh, it actually turns out very similar to what we we're Okay, so quickly going through the exterior, um, again, uh, the emphasis on the, uh, the middle plaza as the heart of the campus. And to really create this heart of campus, here you can see we had to, uh, somehow overcome the challenge of bringing people in uh, to the plaza, but and then across from the uh, stormwater conduits. So we had this idea of coming up with the bridge, which we'll, come, or we'll talk about later. So um, this is the plaza um, formed by the two, two buildings, um, very um, smooth curve that uh, sort of embraces the plaza. And then this is what we have uh, envisioned during the design stage, that would be the hub of activities. And this is actually the rendering of the, uh, the completion of it. So it looks very, uh, spatially, it looks very similar. Um, you know, they actually have had uh, several events there uh, already. So, and they're quite happy with the result. And again, uh, it's uh, very open to uh, uh, bicyclists. Uh, you can actually ride all the way in from the sidewalk onto the plaza, which is very fitting uh, for, obviously, for bike company headquarters. Uh, some of this, uh, details through the sections, uh, section details through the, both the bicycle ramps and the balconies. So the balconies here, you can see one of the interesting thing is, um, you know, we actually tilted the, um, the glass railing in the same angle as the, uh, as the element panels, uh, because we didn't want that sense of rhythm to be broke, interrupted by these vertical uh, glass railings. So we tilted the railings as well. So here you can see, uh, I think the, this is uh, the ramps are still vertical configuration, but as you move up the building, the glass starts to tilt as well. So it's very um, careful uh, coordination between the structure, 
the and the exterior wall work that I was able to uh, achieve this result. You know, looking at all the ramps. So it, again, so we wanted to uh, really through this series of ramps to sort of in, to bring people, uh, you know, down into the plaza and also up the building. And these ramps could also uh, become uh, areas where people. Uh, can sort of uh, stand and watch all the activity that's going on in the plaza. And also, um, you know, the ramps, we design them uh, at a uh, one to 12 um, slope. So it, it sort of meets the handicap code, but uh, obviously for liability reasons, we don't really encourage people to ride on them, but, you know, being, you know, by company, all the employees are very good riders. So they are, you see people constantly zipping up and down the ramps. And then at uh, the third floor, at, you know, we created a very spacious and very uh, open um, bike uh, storage room. It's probably one of the nicest bike storage rooms you'll ever see. Uh, and then you know, see people um, riding on the streets. And then you know, there's a big, uh, great difference between the side and the uh, sidewalk. So to overcome that, we actually came up with this idea of uh, having a bridge that will cross over the conduits onto the uh, sidewalk ramps. So again, the whole design started from uh, hand sketches computer and money. And then really in the shop that these are these Z-shaped um, bent uh, steel plates trying to, uh, to, um, to really achieve a very smooth finish that would uh, fit in with the architecture and how the bridges uh, that span across that naturally opens up onto the plaza and then work in conjunction with the paving. So this is looking up from the building. So this whole assembly becomes whole. And then also a lot, uh, effort was give, um, put into the lighting design of the project. So uh, the lighting design is always very tricky because um, you know, I, I personally, I don't think the current software does a very good job of modeling that. So we actually, especially in terms of we, we want to do uh, this logo on the, on, on the museum without doing the traditional hangout, like a big uh, light box. So we actually want to integrate with the panels. So we came up with the idea of um, doing an out of a perforation that's big perforation. So three types of uh, three types of um, openings. Um, that but how, how to, so the mix of that was actually become very important. Uh, and then the client was I had some reservations like will 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 people be really be able to read the look logo? And then on top of that, we want light to sort of come through shine from the back. So we actually did uh, a mock-up to one, one of the panels and uh, we brought to our office. We did our own lighting check uh, outside of our office, right in the alley and also in the shop, you know, just trying to get the, the lighting level just right because all the light comes from actually underneath uh, shining up. So how to keep, achieve an even illumination and how it visually stands out. So this is the final. So I think, um, you know, it looks, what well, we're very happy with the result that the combination of these three um, diameters, how they perform, uh, you know, together achieve a very legible uh, reading of the logo. Um, and at night, uh, you know, it also achieves uh, what you can still um, be very visible at night. And then uh, so all the access panels of where the lighting fixtures are below. So, uh, and, you know, we, uh, when we, when, when the building was first completed, um, the, you know, they had this line underneath and everybody thought it was intentional. I was like, oh, it's kind of nice. You guys sort of underlined our, uh, put an un underline. I was like, no, 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 that's not what we want. We, we, we didn't want that line. So we're trying to figure out wait, why, why is there a line? Why is light coming through at that, that space? So, um, you know, for the longest time, we couldn't figure it out. I was like, did we make a dis mistake in design or fabrication? It turns out like the, the, the caulking they used, uh, the one of the, the, the workers, they did the, they caulk the transparent uh, caulking. Uh, so that's why the light was coming through. So once we substituted that with the black, uh, to the, 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 the black kind, the non-transparent kind, the problem was solved. So that's just shows you even the best design intention sometimes, you know, goes a little bit wrong in the field, but you know, well, fortunately it was very easy to correct. And also the logo kind of looks like it. We, we did a little mock-up, you know, like a Twitter, but that's, a, that's only part of the logo actually. That it, so uh, again, you know, playing, uh, with the uh, coverage of the and, and the amount and the size of these LED bulbs to achieve, um, because the client wanted the, the logo to read as blue and uh, the corporate color in the, at night, but in uh, in, the, in during the day and but at night want this uh, to uh, to illuminate as white. 
to 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 have the greatest effect. So you know, how, so all that testing was to achieve the proper result. The interior again, very open plan. We put all the core to one side, very open spaces, flexible with a big um, atrium opening on in the lobby. And again, you can see this is a typical office floor. With so once you step inside the atrium, we uh, we didn't do the interior design, but we worked closely with the interior designer uh, to make sure that the um, the same language, architectural language, is consistent um, that carried into the inside. And we actually um, determined the the architects. We decided the the the, the shape of the stair because. Um, uh, but we actually, because we actually did the, the, the structure what the work was done with. So we dictated this angular, very strong presence in the otherwise very curvilinear uh, space. So this is the um, effect. So, and then the interior job design also did a very good job of cladding that, the stair integrated with lighting. And then this is the, uh, on the third floor, out, second floor outside the auditorium. So this is one of the areas where you can really see the inside and outside effects. Uh, working uh, beautifully together with the light and shadow and yeah, different shot. And when you're in the inside, you can really see the ramps uh, trickling around the building. And then every so often you have see a, a rider coming down the ramps, which is a very, uh, very unique uh, uh, effect. Again, this is looking at the uh, plaza. Uh, this is now going into the museum, a uh, big open lobby. Again, we didn't do the interior of the museum, but we made sure that whoever did it had to follow this spatial concept that we have, which is a very uh, soaring uh, atrium uh, once you enter the museum. Um, and then the display on the inside is actually very interesting. Uh, actually all, all about cycling culture. So it's not just about giant, it's really about the uh, history of bicycle, how cycling works, and then even some of their um, you know, latest uh, technology. And you can even do a sort of virtual ride of a Tour de France uh, on these machines. And then this workshop that we always, we, we suggested to a client to be open to the outside so people can look in and the house and sort of get their hands on and see people trying their hands on trying to fit a bike. Again, this is the, uh, not a rendering, it's actually, real effect of uh, looking up at the skylight uh, from the top floor of the museum where there's a currently a cafe. And then in closing, so I just wanted um, to sort of take you one last round through the project. Again, this is the most um, most often shot taken of the project. So sort of the, the balconies the, that, that connects the two buildings, the walkway, that uh, how they naturally frames and the view of the, the, the tower and when uh, how you're uh, underneath on the plaza that it provides shading, but also through the light and play of shadow is actually a very um, dynamic uh, space. And, but we also uh, enliven it with a, a tree, uh, the, the tree pit. And then you also have this um, by following the visually, your eyes follow the ramp naturally up the building. And then uh, also how the ramps, the, the space between the ramps and the building and becomes very interesting as you walk along. It's about uh, probably 10 feet wide and you walk how, how you sense the um, building kind of uh, wraps around you. And then you work your way up, how your view is constantly shifting. And then uh, the composition both at day and night, I think in the end, the client was very happy that it really gave a, you know, a new identity a very striking and also uh, captured the essence of um, their, their their corporation and the choice of aluminum panels to prove to be the right choice. Uh, and with their, they didn't know that you know aluminum is a material they're very familiar with because a lot of their bicycle frames are made of aluminum, but then really take it on a, an architectural level uh, to express the same sense of motion. I think they were quite surprised by that. So um, you know this is a, a, a night view of the project. So. Um, uh, and then uh, because it's a museum, uh, so we actually are very welcome to visitors. Uh, so whenever you come to Taiwan, please pay a visit. And then the, the, a lot of these souvenirs actually uh, were not designed by us, but we thought it was kind of cute uh, that they, they took the uh, architectural language and sort of translate into stationaries. And it did this one's a more abstract interpretation of the museum and the tower that turned into stationary. Very, very clever, I thought. And then it's also been featured in um, Mercedes Karma car commercials. Uh, so it's, I think a lot, 
uh, at least for me, but I think for a lot of architects, it's always imagine oh, one of your projects could become the background for these car commercials because they usually tend to stay, uh, you know, select some very visually uh, interesting and dynamic uh, buildings as their background. So we're very happy that Mercedes selected us. Um, but I think the best projects are the, the, is a type that, you know, that you can um, not only admire it as an architectural piece, but you can actually turn it into a cake and eat it. So, so this was uh, for uh, Mr. Pan's uh, 80th birthday, which was uh, two weeks ago. So we had this um, building, I had a cake maker. <laughs> <laughs> make up a cake out of the form of the building. And then he was, and then we I actually, the, the challenge, the biggest challenge was actually how to cut the cake. So uh, in the end it was cut in a plainer fashion. Um, so with, so that would not destroy the form of the, the cake. And then, uh, so that's it about the building and the firm. So we've actually had, so for those of you who want to know more about the firm, uh, you're always welcome to go to our website uh www.jjpan.com it's a it has an english version and those who want to know more about the philosophy of the firm and also know about Joshua, you can there's actually a, we recorded a podcast episode uh that's uh, right on the gsgsap website episode number 94 and that was also, uh, a dialogue between Joshua and johnny um you know who's currently dt's t my associate president in taiwan so um again thank you for listening and then I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you for your amazing presentation and for introduction for today's piece. And mm. for now, we starting from a few sections and I've seen like the, uh, uh, the D, D1, do you have the questions? Do you want to ask the questions? Uh, it seems some have technical issues, or maybe I just start from yes. first. And just a uh, quick question: Like, since JJP is one of the largest firm in Taiwan, just how does like GSET experience benefit for you and like Mr. Panji for like design your uh, develop your design, running your companies, and like uh, building your reputations and identify yourself different from other international firms, just as a uh, Taiwan architect. Okay, okay. Be uh, because of the virtue of our, our 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 size being one of the largest in Taiwan, we always felt that you know we should play a more uh, leading role. Try and really try because Taiwan is um it's a uh, still sort of kind of a insular um um uh, country that we we're very we're good we're very good at a lot of things, but we really don't tend to. Um, make them more visible to the uh, the rest of the world. So um, so what, so if you see um, not only ourselves but for a client like Giant, you know they've already achieved a very uh, high level um, you know status in terms of in the in the biking world. But not many people know about them. So um, so when a client like this approaches us, so we become very interested in trying to give. Um, form to their aspirations because it's us it's really a, a, a like a building like headquarters really about like you know in many ways it's branding not just for the client self but also for the architects for the designer so um, we try to do it in a language as you could see that's very contemporary uh, but it also conveys the um, essence of the client and also what we believe in really just to have the, the sort of the form really um, derived from the function and all, but at the same time trying to um, aspire to a higher level of meaning. So I think as being the largest firm, we get, up, we get more opportunities like this to sort of, um, you know, work with our clients to uh, take it to a, to a, a higher level. So, um, but the downside of it, obviously, is we don't have a lot of opportunities to do very small, more like um, unique projects, I, I would say, because um, I, I know a lot of the architects in Taiwan, they're uh, very uh, much into the, um, the localized uh, context and the local trying to express more of the local culture. We try to do that as well, but we, a lot of the times the sizes of our projects uh, would not allow an, a, 
but that allow us to do that. So instead, more, more often, we actually choose to actually engage the outside world more, you know, in the, on the international level, both through our um, design and also like activities like this, that we actually try to sort of play a role, like making people more of a, aware of Taiwan and Taiwanese architects in general, sort of to help um, the, the society or the, in, the industry as large, yeah. So yeah, since there's no uh, continuing question, so I just continue my, uh, yeah, okay. my questions. Just like, Please. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's important like rather <clears throat> raise awareness of like Taiwanese architecture and like promote mm. your, uh, your company and to try to uh, demonstrate or benefits for JJP uh, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, just like you have mentioned, like giant group, they want to identify themselves as branding for Indonesia as well. And then you show like the Mercedes Benz commercial in the mm. end, and kind of reminds me that the like, US studio designed the uh, Mercedes Benz Museum. Yes. So you have a similarity in like the design language and uh, the, the, the like a fancy yeah, the, shapes. Just like, yeah. uh, I, I appreciate it and like the design, but just like, uh, quite different than like uh, people from like Europe or like, from mm. the Middle East, like they tell different from like the US studio design and your, your firm's design. Yeah. Okay, so we yeah, that's very interesting question because um, the client, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the chance, but they actually visited a lot of these uh, museums, car museums in 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 Europe, including the Mercedes, the Porsche. So they actually, so they are. So when we came up with this sort of architectural design, they're actually very used to. It. They they've seen it before. So there there was a very it was very easy to reach a comfort level. So in the beginning, we were kind of worried because a lot of Taiwan. Taiwanese uh, companies, they're still more very much traditional thinking. They would think, oh, you know, this is a little bit too, too, too out there for me, you know. This is, but as you can see, we the amount of um, the craftsmanship. So the challenge was us was not really in terms of the design, but the, the challenge was really how to do this design, not in Germany. But actually, in Taiwan, oh, yeah. and with, with 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 the budget constraint, I, I, I'm 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 not sure how much they spent on the on the museum in Germany. But we, but the, this one is actually very. It's actually in line with a typical box boxy curtain wall building the, you know, in terms of the bot. So to achieve this kind of result, and then uh, in terms and the construction uh, technology in Taiwan is obviously not as advanced as in Germany. So there's a lot of like you can see like a trial and error, right? Every step of the process, we kind of have to push the um, contractor and the subcontractor say, okay, you have, we have to do this mock-up. We kind of have to test it out bef before we know that it can actually work. Because once you installed, it, it's really, you know, it's very hard to take it off of the building. So we like, so we, 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 were, we didn't really have the confidence in the um, construction industry in Taiwan that actually can deliver uh, the, this kind of result. So the form that is that that's also a big reason why you know not only to save on the budget but also we try not to go too crazy, you know, mm -hmm. because we know it, it, we might not be they might not be able to deliver uh, in, on, on the construction end. So um, but we're, so we're very happy in the end that the result came out. I definitely wouldn't say it's hundred percent, but it's also uh, you know. It's a, still a very high level. And there's also, you know, so this um, corporate identity, you know, whether it's a car or a bicycle, I think it's all, it's all, all about like, uh, you know, it's a means of transportation. So when you do like a headquarters for them, I think the first thing of is you want to capture is the sense of movement, the, the, the dynamic, right? It's not a very, it's not a static product that these companies make. So, um, and then sort of just, led itself to the choice of aluminum panels as the most suitable language that, that actually easier to as a, to manipulate in terms of form. So, um, you know, and we have a giant being a global company, they actually have a lot of, uh, they have a big European operations. So, uh, you know, I, they actually, and every year they would invite all, people, all the employees uh, uh, from around the world back to their headquarters. So one time, 
I actually was on site when they had this big uh, meeting and I did see a lot of Europeans of course I, so I kind of uh, approached them uh, and then tell who, them who I was but I just said oh what do you think of this building I was like oh it, it, oh we love it it looks like it could just be in Germany so I I I, I take it as a compliment, I guess, <laughs> that they were very surprised to see, oh, wow, our, our, our headquarters actually looks like some of the buildings they're used to seeing in, in Europe. <laughs> so, 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 so to me, that, that was very, um, you know, satisfying to, to hear that. Yeah, yeah, it's, mm. it's kind of interesting, just like, uh, because of all, in terms of identification, just like yesterday, mm. we our uh, MSAD program, we have like the, uh, oh yeah. In here. yeah. So like, just like, uh, it kind of like a cliche. It's like the vernacular architecture in Vietnam, right. and coal and the, the bamboo material, those like the greenery in all, all over the facade. So it's kind of cliche, a cliche, but just like they have their identity. So, and so I'm, st I can now, I can help but start thinking like. I know that like, JDP does a lot of high tech uh, um, mm -hmm. factory, just like you have seen, like San right. uh, the headquarter of Giant. And the for me, just like a new typology of the manufacturer, just because like the manufacturer is very, the, the scale is very large, and like this kind of manufacturer, it's kind of like Taiwanese uh, characteristic. Yeah, you don't see any rest of the world, just like. Because like the industrial of warfare tech is in Taiwan is like very unique and like this TSMC is the world top of company and and it just I think it's like a chance and like uh, the identification of like this TDP and all the I don't know just like for me just like a new typology for my picture in yeah yeah, yeah. no no how yeah that's, that's very interesting point because I mean as architects we the work we do pretty it very much reflects the economy of, of, of the country that we operate in, right? So uh, Taiwan is, you know, the dominant industry is the high tech industry. And then uh, JJP actually plays a very big role in that. But we always say, okay, it's not the most uh, glamorous because the form is really dictated by their assembly process, right? They, they, they need these big open, the, the big warehouse type spaces that put their machinery in them. But, um, we still try to, at least on the outside, to give it a more humanistic, uh, sustainable uh, form. And, and you contrast that with, uh, for example, what in the US, probably like a lot of the uh, Amazon, for example, okay, uh, Amazon facilities, right? They're all just big, bland, very, you know, mundane uh, warehouses, right? With all, almost no architectural, you know, treatment or thoughts, but we, but in Taiwan, we actually try to do something very different from that. You know, it's still a big box, but uh, we try to give this sort of a building typology a, a more uh, a different look than a typical look. So yeah, I think you're right. We actually, we are in the process of coming out with a, not, not a full monograph, but a sort of a, 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 a volume of, of a dedicated to sort of this typology because we really think it's very unique uh, to Taiwan that, 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 that this uh, in, uh, build, building typology exists and such dominant uh, place in, in the architectural uh, industry. So. Yeah, I can ask more questions, but like, I want to leave a chance to the audience. Just like we have like 17 people here. Do, uh, does anyone want to ask more and know more about like the JT uh, and have architecture? You can post in the QA. Uh -huh. and we will ask for you. Okay, so, uh, everybody, most people from Taiwan, or uh, we have a lot of international um, guests uh, today. I have some of uh, my classmates are from like Dubai, from uh, oh, okay, like, from uh, Europe. They they are interesting, but in this uh, uh, Zoom webinar, I cannot see you who really participate. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And most of, and, and many of the uh, friends from China, plus me from China, are interested in your friend as well. Because, okay. Have, like in Beijing and in, yes. Uh, so, in so, Shanghai as well. So, maybe you can mention about more about like your yeah, so part, career in, in, China, in China. Okay. So, so um, obviously, the uh, we actually had started our, 
office in China about 15 years ago. So that was a very long time ago, right when China was opening up. Uh, and obviously in the beginning it was really to serve the Taiwanese, our Taiwanese clients who just, who uh, decided to have operations in China. So we kind of, they kind of took us along with them. But I think recently because um, China now is, uh, is really coming into its own uh, in terms of in, in all aspects, you know, society, economy and everything. So we actually are very interested in really doing a lot more different type of uh, buildings and also serve a lot of different type of clients in China. So um, our, because there's, there's a lot of our good opportunities in China. So that's why uh, we have a office in Beijing, Shanghai and Xiamen. So we're really hoping that through this, I, and I think because you know we share um, Taiwan and China, we share the same common culture. Um, so we really think that uh, we, 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 we are a unique position to really uh, bring in uh, some sort of uh, not entirely local, but also very familiar with, with the local context and culture, as opposed to, because we know that there are a lot of, already a very lot, lot of international firms operating in China, but we think that DJP can be sort of like in the bridge between uh, all the, you know, foreign firms, the big name Western firms, and all, and then the local, uh, the, the, the local architecture industry. So we're kind of like a unique position. So we kind of hoping that, uh, you know, more, um, Chinese architects and Chinese, bright Chinese architects, students like those of Colombia can join us in, in China. We're very, very happy to have them. Thanks for like those details answers and for, yeah. And since I'm kind of run out of time, if we don't yeah. have any more uh -huh. ways, so uh, we are pleased to everybody to join this. Uh, uh, this event, and we would like yes. to invite everybody to have like group photo. It's everybody. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to see and your faces. Your <laughs> and, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I see. I hope I see some some familiar faces. Uh, is, is that is that an option? Can everybody turn on their cameras, or is see, it? The, uh, Karen or Leslie can can everybody turn on their camera? Um, let me see. Uh, okay. I'll a shout out to Karen. Hi, Karen. I uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I, I hope I can uh, meet you in person someday. And uh, we we're very happy to always very happy to have GSET uh, graduates uh, joining us. Big, big, uh, and thank thank you, GSET, for inviting me to. Uh, just so I go on the record uh, to say that <laughs> I know the recording back on, and also. Um, you know, Leslie's been very instrumental in helping us put this together. And again, thank you, Javier. You did a wonderful job um, introducing uh, uh, the firm. Um, the, and um, so um, thank you, everybody. I hope this will give you better sense of uh, what JJP, who, who we are. And then uh, just through one example of the giant headquarters that, you know, you see the, the level of architecture that we can do and some of the design thinking behind uh, the work. So very happy to be back at the school uh, in the virtual format. Mm -hmm. And then hi to all my friends in New York. Uh, I hope I get to uh, visit you all in person soon. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, David. Thank, thank you, you for all your time. And that was that no was problem. The presentation. Um, I'm going to just let everyone know that um, it will be posted online and it will be in upcoming newsletters. So for anyone who wasn't able to join um, uh, during this particular time, it will be available. So yeah, I know it's a Friday evening, so go out and enjoy. <laughs> it's Thursday, but uh, yeah, there's oh, Thursday. Oh, that's, a, that's final almost a weekend, this. right? <laughs> yeah. New York is reopened, so you can, you can all go out now. <laughs> So very happy to to see and hear all about you. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.